Good morning. I am honored to be here to share this word with you. And uh, before we do anything else, let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to just open our ears and make us sensitive to what he is saying to the church this morning. So right where you are, just lift your hands, close your eyes, and just invite him and say, Holy Spirit, give me ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let my heart be receptive and let your word come forth. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, uh, the title of today's message is This Season Belongs to the Prepared. And I woke up a couple of weeks ago and that is exactly what the Lord told me. This season belongs to the prepared. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Can you elaborate? And I just kept asking the Lord because that phrase kept bothering me. What do you mean this season belongs to the prepared? And he began to start showing me how what he is requiring in this season from the bride of Christ is mindset shifts. There's gonna be things that change in our mindsets this season that's actually gonna make us prepared so that we can take hold of what this season is to bring. This is a very special time. I feel the Lord has been waiting for this time for a while and we have to be prepared in order to take full advantage of what he wants to do at this hour. And so similarly to how David was prepared in the sheep um, just as a shepherd and, and taking care of them. He was prepared for, for battles. He was prepared for opportunities that came. And this is a similar situation we're in. We're being prepared and it's gonna be a mindset shift in the body of Christ. And so as I have started to study, what does the Bible say about being prepared? What does the Bible say about that? There's actually not a ton of scripture about that. But there are a lot of people who there were people who were prepared versus people who were not prepared. And, um, but there is a scripture in Proverbs 24, verse 27, that uses the word prepare, and I want us to read it together. Solomon writes, prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. So today we're gonna to talk about the three mindset shifts that I see that the Lord is wanting to highlight to the body of Christ that is going to help us be prepared, is going to help us be the ones who are the prepared. And so the first one is planting before building. So if we see in this proverb, Solomon is telling us to prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. See, there's an order of operation. In order for us to do things according to the blessing of the Lord and according to do it to the, to the instruction of the Lord, there is a need to plant before building. There is a need to give attention first to what is productive and then to what is comfortable. And there is the first mindset shift that has to happen is so many people in the body of Christ, they prefer to make themselves comfortable before actually producing any fruit. And it's easy, especially in today's modern comforts, to get so inundated in that mindset that we miss actually being productive for the kingdom. And the Lord is wanting us not to worry about the house. He's wanting us to worry about the field. And somebody that just encapsulated that so well was David. David had this heart after the Lord where he, he was a true worshiper. He worshiped in spirit and in truth. We know that he, the Lord was so pleased with his, his, um, his mindset towards the things of God and his passion and reverence towards the presence of God. There was something so special in that day and time because no one taught him. Only by the spirit of God was he be, being able to be this amazing man after God's own heart. But one thing David wanted to do when he was king was he wanted to build. He wanted to build a permanent house of the Lord that he could reside in. And so in that time, David had just completely transformed Israel into this like true worship um, movement that had happened. And they had, they had never been 
empowered to write and to uh, worship the Lord on a constant basis until the times of David. It was, it, was a, it was a special time that God was restoring something so special in that area because we know Israel went back and forth with struggling with idolatry, with struggling with serving the Lord versus not serving the Lord. And David was able to get the people to be true worshipers. And so he, would, he had this tabernacle set up where people, it was this open tent and people worshiped all day long. But he had a desire to build something permanent because there was a problem in Israel. A lot of people, they were worshiping the Lord outside of Jerusalem and they were worshiping the Lord on altars that weren't that did not meet the specifications of Exodus, where the Lord told them to build their altars differently. And so here David is and he wants to build. And this is, the the Lord tells David, you are not to build, you're to prepare. It is Solomon who is to build your son. And let's read that, what David says in 1 Chronicles 22, five, he says, for David said, Solomon, my son is young and inexperienced and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all the lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials and great, great quantity before his death. So there had to be the preparation in order for the next generation to be successful in the build. See, David's heart was to make this place where Israel can actually worship in Jerusalem properly. And he wanted to do it, but it wasn't for him to do. It was for the next generation to do, but he had to be the one to prepare. What if he got offended with the Lord and said, well, I wanna build. I wanna be the one to build it. It's my idea. I'm the one who came up with it. But he didn't act like that. A lot of modern Christians, whether we say it externally, Internally, that is the, that's the thought. I want to carry out. This was my idea. We never think, well, maybe the Lord is meaning me to be the preparation for the next generation to carry out this assignment. And instead, David was such a man after God's own heart. He was okay with plant, being the one to plant and that his son would be the one to build. He was okay doing the order of operation that the Lord wanted him to do. And so then... Time goes on, David does all the preparation and then it was time for Solomon, the next generation, to build this beautiful temple. And it was time for him to do it because the worship, it was, it was a big deal to the Lord and it was time for everybody to be able to worship in Jerusalem. And so when they started building, there was a specific way they would even build. And because it's not only important when we build to the Lord, but it's important how we build. And... First Kings chapter six, verse seven, this is what it says. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. So one thing that we, we see from this passage is even how they were building the temple, they were building it with reverence. They weren't trying to, um, you know, do it, you know, um, and be loud about it. And, but they were doing it, they were carrying it with such reverence that even the stones were already formed before they even brought it. And this has always been important to the Lord because back in ancient Near East, they would, the Canaanites would, would worship on, at these specific altars. And these altars were built by stone of man and they were carved with certain tools by man. And even they would uh, create uh, false idols and golden idols and statutes and all sort of things that is created by the hands of man. But the Lord was very specific in, um, for Israel, even back in the times of Moses and Exodus, where when he was teaching them how to worship properly, he was teaching them how to even build an altar properly because they, they could easily mold the way that they worshiped and the way they built altars to Yahweh, they could mold it after the Canaanites. And the Lord wanted a people that was set apart. And this is, this is the important part about planting before building is so many people want the outward display They want to do it in their striving. They want to do it in their strength. But the Lord is looking for a people who will do it his way, who will actually lay down their preferences and lay down, you know, hey, I want to build this successful empire. Well, maybe that's not what the Lord is calling me to do. What is the Lord calling me to do? And so in Exodus, I want us to read the law of the altar because it's so beautiful. In Exodus 20 verses 22 through 25, it says, 
Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven and you shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold shall not make for yourself. An altar of the earth you shall make for me and you shall sacrifice it your, on it, your burnt offerings and your peace offerings and your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by the steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. This is a really beautiful thing that's happening that the Lord is teaching them about worship. He did not want them carving it with their own tools. He wanted it by the stones that were already made by the earth, by him. The Lord is not looking for people who can just look the part. He's looking for people who actually are the part. And so the, the difference is so many people, even throughout Christianity, have built their own empires, built their own careers, built their own things, and those things are great. But are we building it the Lord's way? Are we doing it in the order that he's asking us to do it? And are we doing it in the generation that he's asking us to do it? Are we being obedient? And so the reason why the Lord had these specifics um, for the altar, the law of the altar, was because he wanted, again, he wanted Israelites' altars to be unlike the Canaanites' altars. He wanted them to be set apart, that this is a partnership with him. That it's not just us doing everything and striving and making things happen. I got to make my assignment happen. I got to, I got to be like Abraham and I got to create an Ishmael. Instead, he's wanting us to partner with him supernaturally to create an Isaac. And this is, this is our decision that we get to make and the mindset shift we get to make. It is not normal. It is not normal for our culture to plant before building, but the Lord is looking for those who would be willing to do that uncomfortable thing. And the second mindset shift that the Lord just kept, it was like pounding in my head over and over again was beware of hypocrisy. Beware of hypocrisy. And the people that he was talking about, I want us to read in Luke chapter 12, verses one through three, because this is literally where he talks to his disciples about this. And so let's read this together. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, they had trampled one another. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And whatever you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. So he's teaching his disciples about this, this thing that can corrupt them so easily. Beware of hypocrisy. A religious spirit is so easy to seep into the church and to God's people because we know how to say the right things. We know how to appear the right way, but the inside is not right to the Lord. And that is what he's wanting to deal with. And so, in fact, when we read Matthew 23, 25 through 28, he's actually talking to the Pharisees. And so this is what Jesus said. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish and inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that's so interesting to me that the Lord called the Pharisees lawless because they were the ones that were the most upset that he wasn't keeping the law of the Sabbath over and over and over again. So it's like they had the law, but they were filled with lawlessness yet still. And that's so interesting how we can appear one way, we can even you know, trick so many people, but inside we can never trick the Lord. We can never fool the Lord. He sees it all and he's looking for the real deal. He's looking for the real deal, the people. And even David, like he, he, he broke some of the, the law, the, the rules of the law when it comes to eating the bread. And even Jesus quotes him um, because he's showing that it's not necessarily about the, the rules or, or appearing right. It's about actually being right with the Lord. It's about the motivations of our heart. And if, there is, if there's a dis, 
discrepancy against what we're actually doing and versus what our hearts are at and the motivations of our heart and what our hearts are actually thinking and the pride of our hearts begin to grow. The Lord will remove his hand. He will remove his favor. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And he's wanting us to be careful with hypocrisy. I feel like every time I get the opportunity to share the word of the Lord, he has me sharing on the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. So I am so sorry if you are tired of hearing it. He's not tired of speaking about it. So I guess I won't be tired of sharing it. But I've, there was this new revelation that the Lord had given me about the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And I wanna share it with you when it comes specifically to hypocrisy. I want us to read it together. Matthew chapter 25, verses one through seven. Jesus says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out and meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our, our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. And as I was studying this, the Lord showed me a different angle of this parable because when it says they were all sleeping, they all had their lamps, five had the oil already in their lamps. And when they woke up, they all trimmed their lamps. Well, the, the Greek word for trimmed is cosmeo, which is compared to the word cosmetic. So they all beautified their lamp, arranged, decorate, furnish, embellish, adorn, put in order. They all looked the part, but only five actually had the power to sustain them in the darkness. The oil represents throughout um, scripture represents the power of the Holy Spirit. Only five had the power to actually light the path all the way. So here's the thing that we've, we've gone so long where so many churches and so many people in the body of Christ look the part. They all look right. They've all trimmed their lamps, right? But there's coming a time, and this is the season, where only the ones with the oil will actually have the power to make it all the way. And this is the season we're in now. And we get the oil, we can't, we can't get it from somebody else. We can't be like, share it real fast, share it real fast. It has, it's costly. It must cost us something. It comes from the presence of God. We can't just try to, try to beg our way. We have to, we have to pay the cost. And that, that goes to the third mindset shift I see happening in this hour is we have to count the cost. We have to count the cost. This is our opportunity to count the cost. And so in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33, I wanna read the cost of discipleship. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and he is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Who? what a word. What a word. Jesus, I don't see an apology here. I'm sorry. He, he, I don't see, I don't see that. Jesus knows his worth. And I know Marcel always makes a joke. He tells all the men, know your worth, king. <laughs> 
But this is literally Jesus knowing his worth. He knows how valuable it is to be a follower of Christ. He knows the fruit and the, the, the treasure laid up in heaven that will be reaped by being a disciple of Christ. But we like to try to be a lot like the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he asks him, how can I, how can I follow you? How can I do everything right or whatever? Paraphrasing, this is Deborah's version. And, and so basically Jesus was like, oh, we'll keep the law. And he said, well, I've kept the law. And he said, well, if you wanna be perfect, take your, your wealth, sell everything you own, distribute it to the poor and come follow me. And it says that the rich young ruler was sad because he was very wealthy and he, and he left. And Peter in Luke 18, 28 through 30, he looks at Jesus after this encounter. And this is what Peter said. He said, see, we have left our homes and have followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So the rich young ruler, when you think about it, in the light of eternity, he made a bad investment. He made a really bad investment because Jesus was giving him this opportunity to not only sell all his stuff and he said you would have treasure in heaven, which is eternal, but then he got to be close to the Lord. He got to be close to God made flesh. But see, the, the rich young ruler, he didn't see Jesus's value. Jesus didn't apologize to him and say, you know, I'm sorry. I know this is a lot to ask you. I know this is so difficult for you because you just love all your stuff and you love where you are and you love how easy your life is. But I'm just so sorry. But if you really want it, this is how you do it. He didn't do that. Jesus presented it because Jesus knew what I'm going to give you is actually a greater return for your investment and the eternal perspective than your temporary thing. But the rich young ruler was so mesmerized and he had a mind, he had a mindset of the temporary being more important than the eternal because we see that in his response. He didn't value what Jesus was offering, what Jesus was saying. He didn't see the worth of that. He actually was really sad about that. That's how a lot of Christians handle things is we, we don't see the eternal value of what the Lord is asking us to do right now. We only see what it costs us because we don't put his value higher than our earthly possessions or our earthly comforts or our family or anything else. And so I want us to see how this actually happened in the New Testament. I want us to read two stories that happened back to back. I love that Matthew put this back to back. This was intentional. Matthew chapter 26, verses six through 16. We're gonna read this. The first thing that happens is the anointing at Bethany. When Jesus, was when, when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. And when his disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might've been sold for much and given to the poor. Pause right there. The book of John tells us that that disciple was Judas. John, he just gives all the receipts. So he says Judas said that because Judas was in charge of the money and he was already helping himself to whatever he wanted. So, and that he really wasn't concerned about the poor. So let's pick up on verse 10. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to that disciple, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring the, this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Let's keep reading. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. I love that Matthew puts these back to back because this is showing us 
how we get to decide the value we put on Jesus. We get to decide how costly, what is it worth? What is he worth to us? Every single one of us individually get to decide that. Not our parents, not our children, but us individually. We get to decide how much is Jesus worth? And we get to live it out, not by our words, but by our actions. And so what happens here in this first story is this flask of oil that was broken before the Lord and and preparing him for burial, she was so willing to waste it all. And I'm sure... I am not crazy to even think if she had two or three more jars, she would have wasted it on him too because he was so valuable to her. It was like this revelation of what God had done for her, what, who God was to her, how she had been forgiven and she had to pour it out at his feet. And so as she did this, you know, people were, this disciple was indignant because it was so costly. Do you know how much in today's market, in today's um, system, that jar would have been, it would have been forty to $50,000. It was a year's wage, we know that. But even today, it would, have, it would have been a large sum of money for this woman. And she laid it all at Jesus' feet. And, but then do you know how much 30 pieces of silver would be worth today? And that is the cost that Judas sold Jesus at. He sold Jesus, present day it would be worth $91 to $441, depending on which coin was used. So at most, $441 is what Jesus cost, what the value of Jesus was to Judas. Whereas Jesus was priceless to this woman who would pay this price for him. We, we get to decide how much does Jesus cost us? How much do we, do we value him? But you don't understand, Deborah, I have my family. You don't understand, I have, I'm tired. I can't come to church on Sunday be, and, and listen to what the Bible says, don't neglect the coming together. I can't do that because I'm tired. I'm tired, you don't understand, I got a lot to do. Some of us don't even know how to have a little bit of spiritual warfare. Some of us don't even know how to keep going, how to keep going. This season is gonna belong to the ones who have the prepared mindsets, the shifted mindsets, that it's not about us. It's not about our comfort. It's about planting. It's about doing what the kingdom of God is telling us to do in this, in this hour. And there is a small season of planting. Everybody knows when they're planting crops, depending on the climate, that there is a small window to plant in order for us to actually harvest. But we can build any time of the year. But people want to have the outward reflection. They want to have the outward thing, the beautiful thing shown to everybody who passes by. Look at this house I built. Look at what I built. Look at what I've done with my ministry. Look at what I've done with my career. Look what I've done with my family. And they love that part, but they don't love the planting part. And the Lord is wanting that shift where we love to do the work of the of the Lord, even when it's hidden, even when no one knows about it, even when it costs us more than what people even think it costs us. He wants us to be aware of hypocrisy. Well, we're not hypocrites like the Pharisees. Well, we're not concerned about what's on the outside, but we're not ever concerned about what's on the inside, that we never allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction when our mindsets are wrong. And lastly, he wants us to make sure we're counting the cost. What is Jesus worth to us? What is he worth to us? I'm gonna, I wanna be like the woman. I wanna be like the woman who will lay it all at at his feet. I wanna be like the woman who doesn't even put a second thought to this being a year's worth of wage because I want, I wanna, he's so valuable. I get to be in his vicinity. I get to be in his proximity. I get to be close to him. I get to be forgiven by him. I get to be empowered by his spirit. I get to be in connection with the Lord. And if it costs me my comfort, so be it. If it costs me my time, so be it. If it costs me my resources, so be it. If it costs me whatever it costs me, he's far outweighing it because I know my treasure will be in heaven. And even Jesus said to Peter, we will see it on this side and on that side. But the important part is we trade that side for this side every time, every single time. It's like the the experiment that happened um, with 
with people with their children, they would put one piece of candy before them and said, hey, I'm gonna leave the room, and if you eat this candy now, then that's the only one you get. But if you wait, I'll give you this whole jar or I'll give you this whole, and it's like this large portion. And so you'll see all of the patient children waiting and then all of the wild children not waiting. (laughs) We get to decide which child we're gonna be. We get to decide because if we sacrifice now, if we pay the cost now, that is really not that high of a price to pay. Our return for our investment will be greater than if we just hoard and say, I want this now because I don't know if I'm gonna have it later. He's worth it all, church. He's worth it all.